One of the most accurate time sources we have is from the GPS satellites. In fact, the whole internet is probably synchronized, its time is synchronized using the signal that comes from the GPS satellite. Now, normally your PC will ask a time server somewhere on the internet, what is the current time? And that time server itself is receiving the signal for the correct time from the uh, GPS satellites. Now, it's possible for you to build your own time server using a Raspberry Pi Pico with a GPS module on it. So what we're going to do today is build a time server where you can get the time directly itself from the heavens. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. So as I said, what we're going to do is take a Raspberry Pi Pico W. W goes, of course, we've got Wi-Fi built into it. We're going to connect a GPS module over serial, and we're going to build ourselves a time server. And this is all relatively inexpensive and really quite easy to build. What's going to happen is the Raspberry Pi Pico W is going to get the time via the GPS module, so it has the current correct time. And then we're going to write a bit of software that acts as an NTP server, so your PC can ask it what is the current time. It knows the current time from the GPS module, and then it can reply with that over the NTP protocol. Okay, let's get cracking. Okay, so this is what we're going to build. Obviously here we have a Raspberry Pi Pico W. Here we have the GPS module that can get the date and time from the GPS and this is a cable to an antenna and we'll cover all of these things uh, individually uh, in a moment. So let's talk first about the GPS module. You can get lots of different varieties. They're not very expensive. Often they contain these U-blocks uh, Neo modules. And then here at the uh, top is there are some pins that connect to your uh, microcontroller, in this case, a Raspberry Pi Pico W. So how do you wire it up? Well, there are four pins on here, as you can see, uh, plus 5 volts, RX, TX, and ground, Y, RX, and TX, because basically it talks over a serial port and it sends the GPS information over the serial port. So connecting up is really quite simple. First of all, we connect up the uh, plus 5, and we can do that by connecting to pin 40, which is the VBUS. Pretty simple. Down here you can see we have a ground pin, so we can connect that up there. Pin 38 goes through to the ground. And then with serial, of course, the RX on one thing needs to go to TX on the other. The TX on that one needs to go to the RX on that one. So all we do is put in a TX on this side to the RX here. Look, UR0RX, UR0RX, pin 2. And the RX on here is a TX on there, UART TX. So four wires, two of which are power, and then TX, RX on serial. Pretty simple to connect it up. Now on that first picture I showed that I had a cable to an antenna. Why is that? Well, often when you buy these little boards, and here's a different one, again, which got the U-Blocks Neo uh, on it and the same kind of pins, uh, you get this free kind of GPS antenna. Basically, it's completely worthless. It might work outdoors in a very good situation. If you're doing anything indoors or anything with any kind of interruption to the clear blue sky above, then just forget about using it. I tried using one and I just wasted so much time trying to get it to work. I did eventually get a signal through it, just but it isn't worth it. So what you want to do is you want to buy yourself a proper GPS antenna, okay, and you can get these on like Amazon or whatever. And it's basically, it can it's tuned into the right frequency for GPS and just gets it. And I'm picking mine up indoors without any problem whatsoever. Now, the one thing to notice is they normally come with these SMA plugs that you can see that on the end here, whereas the little micro uh, boards have got a UFL connector on it. So you're also going to need a UFL to SMA plug. Now notice this is the threaded one. It screws into this one, and then this little one is just a press on, just cl clip it onto there like that. So you're going to need three, uh, two things. You're going to need the antenna and the converter to plug into your module. Now the way we're going to be serving time to the computers is using NTP. And I won't go too much into NTP now, we'll cover it just a little bit, but I've got a whole video about how computers synchronize their clocks, NTP and PTP uh, explained. So uh, go and check out that video if you want the actual details of how, in, of how NTP uh, works. But just in uh, very, very quickly, basically with NTP, you get these different levels, stratums they're called, one, two, three, and so on. And the ones at the top, the stratum ones, get their signal from the satellites and what we're going to do is we're going to make a stratum one appliance using this raspberry pi and this gps receiver that we've just been wiring up there and then on your internal network you'll have your little raspberry pi pico here running and it will get the date and time precise date and time from the uh, from the satellites and then a computer on your network you configure it to use 
this uh, Pico as its time server. It says, hey, what time is it using NTP? And then this thing, because it's got the date and time from the satellite, it replies with, you know, it's 10, 30 uh, and 7 seconds. And there are some stuff in here about inbuilt into NTP to make sure that the how long it took for that message to get there, how long it takes that message to get back, get included in the protocol so that the time is accurate because it won't be 10, 30 and 7 seconds exactly by the time the message gets back. But that's all covered, as I said, in that previous video about NTP. So we're going to program the Raspberry Pi Pico W using the Arduino IDE. Why? Because actually you could probably slot in just about any kind of uh, a microcontroller board with networking built in, an ESP32 board, uh, the you know the RP2040 ones, uh, the Maker 1000 range from Arduino, anything that's got Wi-Fi or networking built in and a serial port can act as an NTP server and the code will basically be roughly the same. Before we move on, I just want to remind you, you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains, and I also have a monthly newsletter. Go to GaryExplains.com, type in email address, no spam, but you will get the newsletter. So what happens is, is that the uh, over the serial port, you get these messages from the module that tell it things like the date, the time, the distance, any direction you're heading in, uh, speed, and these are all, all these little messages, GAS, ASV, uh, LL, okay, these are all messages that, that come out standard, and it's all defined in this NME, uh, NMEA GPS data stream, there's a document that defines it all. Now, thankfully, there is uh, several, in fact, we're going to be using Tiny GPS Plus, several different modules that already know how to parse that data. So Tiny GPS Plus is an Arduino library for parsing M, NMEA data streams provided by GPS modules. It provides compact and easy to use methods for extracting position, date, time, altitude, speed, and course from the consumer uh, thing. So of course, most important thing, we're interested in getting the time out. And then the other part of the code will be to actually do the NTP stuff. Okay, let's jump over to the Arduino IDE. All right then, so here we are inside of the Arduino uh, IDE. As I said, this is written for the Pico uh, W, but of course you could use any microcontroller board using this kind of script uh, that has Wi-Fi on it. So up at the top, we need to include some stuff to do with Wi-Fi, we need to include stuff to do with UDP because N, uh, NTP is a UDP base protocol. Time lib, of course, we're gonna to need to do some stuff with time and tiny plus. Uh, GPS Plus, as I discussed earlier, you've got to make sure that's included and you've loaded it as a library uh, via the Arduino IDE. Normal stuff here, the Arduino secrets.h file, which has got your SSID and your password in it. We define a variable here for a Wi-Fi client. We define something for the UDP. We define the port that NTP works on. It happens to be port 123 is the standard. We need to define a buffer here. And then we need to find the pins that we're going to use to talk to the GPS module. Now, basically, this code is split roughly into two parts. One part that reads the GPS module via the tiny GPS Plus uh, library and make sure that it has the current date and time on one side that uh, listens to uh, NTP requests and replies to them. We define a tiny GPS object so we can get that up and running. Then here we have a thing that recalls the last time we had a GPS sync. That's good to know whether you've actually ever had a GPS sync and also it's good to know when it last happened so you can refresh it every so often. That's what this one does here. Sync time how often every 60 seconds. Uh, so basically, I'm not setting the clock on the Raspberry Pi Pico, you know, 15 times a second. I'm, I'll wait a minute, just make sure I've got the right time. If there was a tiny bit of drift on the Raspberry Pi Pico, you won't notice it uh, in 60 seconds. Now, we've got two important data structures here that are to do with NTP. One is the NTP time, which has seconds and fractions of a second. These are all defined inside of the standard. And then what an NTP packet looks like. So we've got eight bits of flags, eight bits of the stratum, eight bits of pole, and so on. In fact, if we just have a look quickly at this here, here is a copy of the uh, relevant RFC, RFC 5905 that defines NTP version four. And you can see here, look, there are eight bits here of uh, the flags, sorry, there are eight bits there of the flags, then the stratum, eight bits, pole, stratum, and then you've got these other things, reference timestamp, 64 bits. Why is it 64 bits? Well, because that's what this is here. This time structure is 64 bits seconds and uh, fractions of a second. Going back here, we can see other timestamps, original time, origin timestamp, received timestamp, transmits timestamp. These are all used in calculating how long it took the message to get across the network to the client to work out what the time is. I cover all of that 
in that video. But this data structure that we've got here is basically a representation of what we need as the NTP packets coming across the network. And why is that important? Because basically once we get the data, we can just copy it straight into a memory location and, in, and access it via this structure and then Lo and behold, I can access origin time or reference time uh, without having to work out how many bits and bytes it is into the data structure. It's all there for me. These are a set of defines here that I have to do again with NTP defines what all those different bits and things mean. So get a leap indicator. Well, that's part of uh, if we look at the specification again, that's part of this leap indicator here. So which bit is it? How do we access it? Uh, and it's just telling you how to get all these different things here by just nipping out those little bits that we need. So they're pretty standard uh, and reflect again what you find in that NTP uh, document. Again, all these defined here. Now, in this bit here, just worth mentioning that NTP time and uh, Unix time are different. Basically, NTP time starts at the year 1900, whereas Unix time starts in 1970. So as we're going between real time, current time, and NTP time, we're gonna to need to do some translations between 1970 and 1900, and that's what these little macros here do for us to make that easier. And this function here, set date time from GPS, well, it's literally that. It makes sure that the GPS information is valid inside that tiny GPS plus module. And then if it is, it just gets the current date and time and sets the date and time according to what the GPS has last received. So that's really, it says what it does on the tin, set the date and time from the GPS. Then we've got a couple of debug or kind of logging functions here, print date and time, print time T, print NTP time. These basically just deal with different data structures and print them out accordingly. Uh, uh, so that you can see what's going on in a few places we might use them. So they're just there for, for debug purposes, for logging purposes, makes life easier rather than have to write this all the time. Again, talking of debugging, we have a dump NTP packet uh, function. This is not enabled when I run this in a minute and I show you it's not enabled by default, but if you're looking into it, it prints out all those things that we found here inside of this thing here, tells you what they all are. So you can debug, you can look at what's going on. What did you receive? What did you send? So useful for learning about NTP. So that's what this dump NTP packet does. Again, it does what it says on the tin. Okay, so the first thing to notice here, we're using setup and setup one. And that is because this is a dual core process. So one core we're gonna to use to do the Wi-Fi stuff, and one core we're gonna to use to talk to the serial port to the GPS module. So both cores are doing uh, their own thing. So basically we need to set up uh, the normal stuff here, including connecting to the Wi-Fi, printing out what the Wi-Fi stuff is so you can see what the address is of the NTP server and starting up the uh, UTP receiver. And set up one running on the other core, it's handling the GPS stuff. So it basically configures serial one. Notice the difference in serial, serial one. This is a second serial port uh, that talks to the GPS module, sets the pins, sets the uh, FIFO size, sets the about board rate, uh, and that's it. Now, likewise, we have a loop and a loop one. So loop is dealing with the NTP traffic because the other one is dealing with the uh, with the GPS. So basically, this is where the main code happens from the NTP uh, point of view. We basically, this course loops round and round and round and round. We wait till we get a packet. Okay, if the, if, uh, the, the packet size is uh, positive, so if there's actually something that's come in, then we start to just deal with the NTP stuff. First thing we do is print out that we've got an NTP packet, where, uh, uh, where we got it from. And then basically what we do is we read that packet. And then as I said here, we do this mem copy. Okay, and that mem copy is the packet that you got into this NTP structure. So now by copying it across, everything is accessible according to that structure. So we don't need to poke around in the bits and bytes there manually. We can just access it now as a nice struct. Now, when you transmit things over the network, the byte order that you have on your local machine or over the network might be different. So there are these functions that convert things to host order from network and uh, to host order uh, to network order from host. So these are basically now that we've copied them across, they may not be the right way around. So we make sure they are. So we make sure they are the same as what is needed by this particular machine, whether it's an x86, ARM, whatever it is you're using, it will uh, it can work it out for you. So that all the numbers mean the right things. 
Then we do a bit of uh, logging here. We say the time on the client is, and that's interesting because when the client sent the packet, it filled out the XMIC time. So we know what the time is on the client. You'll see this running and we just print that out. And notice I've got the dump NTP packet here, but it is uh, currently common out because you don't need it all the time because it produces quite a lot. And then the key thing is here is we then create the reply that we're going to send. Bit more logging here, sending reply at, and then we're using our transmit time and again you could dump out the packet of the reply this is dumping out the packet of the of the request uh, and then the final thing you need to do before you actually send it is do that host to network order thing again make sure everything's the right way around and then basically we just send that udp packet back over the internet okay let's go back up to that uh, uh ntp reply function okay so here it is so we're building a response and so what do we do well we're not sending anything about leap seconds. Uh, we set the version. We say that we're gonna we're a bit pretentious here. We're a, a stratum one. Now there's some stuff here that gets kind of could get calculated really, really, really down to the last kind of five decimal points. I've just hard coded them. If you were writing professional NTP software, this isn't what you'd want to do. But for us, this is good enough for what we're gonna do. And then basically we fill in all the fields here the origin time, the receive time, the reference time, we fill them all in, okay, so that uh, the reply is valid. And you need to go and look at the NTP specification to understand how all that works. Again, watch my video on NTP to see how all these different timestamps are used. But basically, we're filling in the timestamps. The timestamps of now, look, there it is now, okay, is what our XMIT time is, the time that we've received it, and so on. Just make sure they're all in the right way round. So it builds a valid reply that we can send back to the client. And then in loop one, we do things, uh, we're reading the serial port. So this is basically, if there's something on the serial port available, pass it into the tiny GPS plus mod library. It handles it all. We don't need to worry about it. It handles it all. It can uh, interpret all that data. It ignores stuff that's invalid. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, the only thing we do here that's a bit extra is we say, well, when was the last time we synced our clock? And that's where this sync time GPS interval comes in. If it has been a minute, as we had earlier on, 60 seconds, then it will set the date and time from the GPS, print it out just so we can see it there on the console, make sure we update when was the last time we did it, which is now, uh, now. And that's pretty easily. And then if you're not getting any data coming through on the uh, GPS, then we do print out a warning after a while saying there's no GPS detected, make sure that everything is wired up okay. And then finally, there's a function down here again, more logging, display info is not currently called, it's, uh, here it is, commented out, you can use it, that will basically print out all the GPS info it's got, so it's got longitude and latitude, it's got the month, the day, the year, it's got, you know, all the minutes and the seconds, it's even got the number of satellites it's using, the altitude that you're currently receiving, all this kind of stuff, the stuff that comes over the GPS, uh, and it prints it out there uh, for you to see, so that's interesting, if you're running this yourself, you might want to, in enable that at least once so you can see what's going on on your GPS. And that's it, so a pretty simple program, two cores, one deals with the NTP stuff, one deals with the GPS stuff, uh, and uh, be, we just basically fill out the NTP reply when we get a request according to the specification, uh, and that's it. So what we should do now is have a demo. Okay, so here we can see the output from the PQW over several minutes. Basically once a minute, it's basically getting the GPS time and making sure that it's synchronized to the best uh, time. Now what we do is we're gonna use an NTP client to test this out. So here's the NTP client I'm gonna use. I found it on the internet. I'm not associated in any way with this company, but basically if we hit the test button here now, it will send an NTP request. And so there you can see there, packet received from 192.168.1.58. Time on the client is 16.39 and 47 seconds. Sending reply at 14.39 and 46 seconds, of course. This is the difference between uh, universal coordinated time and the local time on the machine. If we look back over to here, it's talked about what's all happened. And it says, yep, the uh, local clock is off by... Uh, that's my PC, my Windows PC was off by, well, 963 milliseconds. So maybe, uh, you know, one second almost. Let's hit that again. Yeah, so that's still there. So there you go, my my PC needs to, this doesn't set the time, this just tests it. And then you, there's all these fields that we like leap indicator and the version number and the root delay and all this stuff we've been looking at, the reference time, the originate time and all that stuff. There it is all there uh, listed out. So there we go. 
uh, you, the code will be in my GitHub repository. Uh, you know, I hope it really works for you. And uh, do let me know in the comments below if you do test it out. That would be great.